Hello, colleagues. Uh, the next session is supposed to start now. And please, if you are in here, you are highly welcome. If you are not in here, you are also highly welcome to stay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please, if you are in here, get seated. Yeah, still try to get seated. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this very important session today, which is a session like no other, where we're going to talk about climate adaptation solutions and focus on how we can be able to leverage these actions to shape financing policies that are enabling for our young people. Today, we have assembled eminent panelists who are going to dive into this issue like no other. And without much ado, I would like to invite our eminent panelists to the stage. And I'll start off with Desmond, Omnia, Jen, Deborah, and Dr. Olufon. So please, if you can find yourself up here we can be able to kickstart the session. protocols observed, it is said that it is the young trees that makes up the forest. This saying couldn't have been more timely. It is timely now more than ever before because as we gather here today, voices of young people across the continent have been heard. Yes, they have been heard because we do understand that over 70% of Africa's population is under the age of 30. As we're speaking today, 42% of the global youthful population will be African in the next seven years. However, the rate of these young people 
participation in productive activities do not match their numbers. For example, as we gather here today, over 50% of our young people are neither employees or employers. In most countries, the youth unemployment rate is double that of adults. Up to 60% of the continents unemployed being youth. We see one in five youth idle are not in employment, are not in education, are not in training. The lost opportunities represented in their talents. These are lost opportunities represented in their abilities, in their interests, and aptitudes of this non participant youth, which is unacceptable under any standard, especially for a continent that is 20 times less productive, competitive than its nearest competitors. Addressing these imbalances is why we are here today to look at how we can be able to leverage climate adaptation and especially climate action to be able to drive solutions to this imbalance. Just imagine this. Climate adaptation globally is estimated to represent up to two trillion US dollars in untapped markets and investment opportunities. In the African continent, as we speak today, every one dollar invested in adaptation actions unlocks a return of between two to ten dollars, be it in food systems, be it in infrastructure or water. This reality shows a chain of enterprises that are actually needed in the continent. Distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, we have a part to play. We have a part to play to ensure that these opportunities that can be real for youth can be able to move from talk to action and reality and inspire our young people to usher themselves to become solution providers. We have a responsibility to ensure this and in a nutshell our panelists are going to break down today the gaps, the opportunities and also the way forward for the continent. Because we understand that the narrative of climate adaptation sometimes it's about projecting liability and social driven actions. But most importantly, some actions that need to be understood are skills retooling, ensuring that our young people can have the requisite skills to be able to take forward adaptation action solutions, to ensure that the financing systems in place can be able to be de risk to tap, especially in the informal sector that harbors up to 300 billion worth of enterprise potential for the African continent to discuss how we can be able to leverage investment plans, especially adaptation NDCs, to ensure that they can attract opportunities, especially from private capital, and to discuss exactly how data for policy can be tapped to influence policy and create incentives by using empirical data from pockets of implementation successes that young people are driving across the continent, and lastly, to de-risk the mind, so that our young people can bring their experience, but at the same time, think right and do right and leverage this opportunity, not only to discuss how the global stock tech, whose report will be released at COP28, can be used as a tool to enable climate adaptation enterprise. Because we know that one cannot be measured, cannot be done. And in all these, and I said this yesterday, before we get into the panel discussion, a good cooking pot will not cook food if there is nothing in it. Without much ado, our panelists are going to break this down and I'll start off Desmond, and Desmond, and to all the panelists, thank you very much for joining us today. Climate change knows no boundaries. We understand this. And you are a young person who is leading not just an initiative in Ghana, but you are actually working to ensure that at least zero waste can be able to empower young people. What I would like to hear from you just in two minutes is how have that work create opportunities for young people, and what are the gaps you are finding? <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity and thank you for being here. Um, I'm Desmond Alugno, uh, Green Africa Youth Organization, and I work with the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternative. So speaking on zero waste and the next change and climate justice, we started that they have capacity gaps, and they are also not able to recognize that resources are within some of these materials that they call waste that is causing the problem. So what we did basically was to develop a model that 
generate income or revenue from almost every kind of material. So it basically relies on the hours that everybody talks about, reduce, recycle, reuse, and repurpose, and what have you. So what we did was to sensitize, build capacity of informal waste workers, inclusive uh, young people who are living within those communities. So we go to uh, the market areas and look at young women who are selling charcoal. And you know that most of our charcoal comes from felling down trees and bending them into charcoal. So we told them that we could actually empower you, support you to empower yourself and get a replacement that is more climate friendly and that is still also generating even more money. And that was to replace that with hard to degrade agricultural waste like uh, um, rice husk, um, coconut husk, and all those other ones. Now we are producing that into charcoal, and that is what they are selling. So the same women that were struggling to buy uh, uh, wood charcoal are now selling that. And then the other thing is, of course, composting. At the moment, the, first, the very first plant, the model includes something that is called material recovery facility. And that material recovery facility is now in four municipalities in Ghana. And the very first one is producing about 4,000 bags of compost fertilizer. Every month. Thank you very yes. much. I think I like the part that you talked about the municipalities, which means that you are working with government. And the inclusiveness of young people and women, that's excellent. Reading through your organization did develop a strategy. And in that strategy, the word youth inclusion was visible. What I want to just get from you before I move to the next panel is, is that instead of using youth inclusion, what do you think? if we were to empower young people to shift from the paradigm of only waiting to be included, but also to be, because you, things are not given, they're taken. What perspective?
and clearly articulating that. That's, that's um, you know, the notion, because it's easy to believe the, the storyline that money is scarce. Money is not there. It is there. It's just that it is not evenly distributed. Now, the second point I want to emphasize, and I think this is for us, all of us who are Africans, and is to appreciate the fact that finance flows in three directions. Number one, finance flows in the direction of a solvable problem. And in Africa, when you look at the things that constitute opportunities in adaptation, solvable problem. Food systems, food security is a solvable problem. Energy access is a solvable problem. Well, and it's very important, and the question is how do we develop the business mechanisms to be able to attract financing because we're dealing with solvable problems. The second thing is finance flows in the direction of capacity and capabilities. And this may be our biggest challenges because it's one thing to talk about available resources, it's another thing to demonstrate the capacity to attract it, but also to manage it. And a lot of young people, I would love to ask a young person with business, show me your account statement, show me the record keeping, the bookkeeping system. These are basic elements of your capacity to manage finance. And the third part is finance flows in the direction of a strategic partnership built on trust. You see, money is not money. Money is not paper. Money is a token of trust. And, 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 and the continuity of the flow is nested in the ability to have that trust. And what has happened on the African continent is that there was a perceived risk that eliminated the trust that limited the flow of capital to young people. Unfortunately, Something, some of those things are out of our control. So what we need to do is to be able to build that trust through our ability to demonstrate that the day you are given $10,000, you can implement good projects with it, show how profitable it is, that you qualify for $50,000, you qualify for $1 million. And that is important. And I think it's important to, to emphasize that. And you went ahead to say we need scale and speed. But you are bringing up a very important aspect here, which is that of a high risk environment. To what extent do you think the attitudes of young people need to be de risk? I know that you talked about capacity and ability to manage, which is a very important aspect. In the discourse of youth opportunities, in the discourse of climate adaptation, it's about resources. But the elements that are supposed to be part and parcel are not always discussed. Do you think? The continent is missing an opportunity and focusing more on sand bites. Well, I, I think th there is a way we need to frame the situation. And I think it's very pr critical that if we miss that framing, we may find ourselves in a very uh, wrong direction. And the thing about wrong direction is speed does not matter if you're on the wrong road. No matter how fast or slow, if you're on the wrong road, you're just even the faster you go, the, the farther you're away from reality. And it's very important to understand that are we all in the right direction when it comes to the things we have to do and the things we have to do differently going forward. So in the African context, what is critical for us at this point is that we need to be able to show so many success stories, and I really do. And look, many of you have heard our president, the president of the African Development Bank Group has been around this week, and they made some huge announcements. But you see, by the time the bank was announcing $1 billion initiative for youth entrepreneurship in climate change, we have demonstrated that even $1.5 million given to 33 people in 20 different countries was a good investment. They were profitable. They employed people. And that's the thing. So the $1.5 million 
the best thing he did was to change the mindset that a young person is an investable asset. Yes, he said that there was excitement. And I, I understand and I believe that young people who are seated in their homes across the continent are asking, oh, wow, this is like a miracle. How can I accept this financing? How? OK. Um, there's a political answer, there's a technical answer. But for the conversation here, <laughs> let's keep it to the technical answer. I think what is important is, please, it's very important, and I beg you here, that it's not enough to have an idea. There is a phase that you need to put the idea to work, in fact, demonstrate the law of your skin in the game, probably through your savings, through your friends, to demonstrate that it's worked to a certain level. The bank does not come in to take idea from zero to one. It comes in to take idea from two to five. Is that clear? It's very, very important. Because a lot of people are talking about how can we assess it. When you talk to them about where are you at in the, in the scheme of, you know, in the, in the cycle of things, they are sitting, I'm thinking about doing this. The bank does not operate on thought level. The bank operates on show results, demonstrable, the, the result is well demonstrated, and then the resources that the bank can provide can help you scale. And that's where the issue of scale and speed comes into play. Amazing. That summarizes the first round of the discussion. And then take it to the uh, uh, participants to be able to provide a perspective. And you heard it very clearly. Value matters. Value matters. You must de-risk yourself. And that's the message that they're coming out here. Yes, there are ideas, as Desmond articulated. Yes, there is action being taken. Equal partnership, as Omnia indicated. Yes, there are carbon markets and initiatives happening, as Jen indicated. Yes, Deborah showcased, yes, communities and indigenous people are working together to tap to these opportunities. But when it comes to finance, the direction you take matters. What says you? Please put up your hand. And uh, it could be a question or an answer to a question that you heard or a comment. Yes, please. Um, the way the room is structured, it looks like you need to get to the microphone and speak, which is good, some good spots. And you can adapt to that as well. Oh, I'm short. Your name, please. Your organization, very quickly, and then <laughs> straight to the question. I'm short, but I'll, I hope you can hear me. My name is Nora Magero. I am from Kenya. I run Drop Access, and we manufacture solar cold chain. One of our notable brands is the Vaxibox, the vaccine refrigerator, the healthcare refrigerator made in Kenya. Now, uh, a few questions about the carbon markets. One, who regulates the carbon market? Just so that we are not stuck in a situation where the people who don't emit the most are the one taking care of that burden. So who regulates it? Is it regulated? I want to know. You see, like for me as a manufacturer, I can, get it, I can tap into that. But then who will check that I'm actually not benefiting from the financing and not giving back by subsidies and so forth? Excellent. I want to know Number who regulates two. it. Number two. Um, all of us, so you've said a lot. Uh, but my question still goes back to, there's so many systems put in place for this to work. And we, we don't even need to generate more money. Why is, it, why is it not still working? What are we doing wrong? What are you doing wrong with financing businesses like us? What are we doing wrong with accelerating ideas and ensure that they actually grow to maturity and they scale up and maybe other institutions come in? What's the missing link? I know you've talked about, obviously, a bank is not going to finance an idea. Obviously, we have to put their skin in the game. But then still, there's still the value of debt. Why do business still die? Like the number of uh, organizations that I know that have closed in the past year is just alarming. Why? What's missing? What is missing? I think we'll take uh, two more questions because we've had three already. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope the panelists are jotting them down. Yes, please, your name you, and straight to the question. Thank you. This is uh, Denji Herman. I'm from uh, Cameroon, representing community based biosynergy management. Uh, which is a member of the People Forest Partnership. I'm going uh, to react in the direction of uh, Dr. Olufonso. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for, the, for what you said concerning uh, partnership. Uh, we realize that uh, many organizations have uh, gotten uh, finances as funding for, uh, for a project, but uh, actually we cannot see the solutions on the ground. That goes to what you say, uh, credible partnership. Therefore, are you not seeing that there is a need for us to change 
the paradigm as far as funding is concerned. So what is the question? How Go we, straight to the question. Yeah, how do we change this uh, paradigm? Okay. Can't uh, donor organizations see what the problem is on the ground? See the approach that uh, organizations are taking in order to bring solutions and okay. then create this uh, partnership. And what do you actually mean by credible uh, partnership? How credible can a partnership be? How credible can credible be indeed? Yes, the last question. My name is Mwangi Derito. Good afternoon, everyone. And my question goes straight to Africa. Yeah, where do you work? Back. Your name and where you work? Yeah. Uh, Mwangi Derito, I'm an agribusiness consultant at Success in Agriculture. Okay. And my question goes to African Development Bank in relation to incubation and training of the youth. Because some of them come from backgrounds where they have nothing. So when you tell them that uh, they have to start at gear two, they have nowhere to start. So the question is, uh, would you be looking at opportunities like working with universities to create incubation centers where the youth can start up and then they can grow? Thank you. Excellent. The last question, and then I bring, come back to the panelists to get their perspective, and then we get back. And, my, um, my name is Clive Donnelly. I'm a youth climate policy advisor under the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. My question will be straightforward. How can we young people navigate the, the barriers of trade? Specifically, the barriers of the, the barriers of trade in carbon markets, specifically when you focus on the voluntary carbon markets, whereby we find that some projects, uh, some companies or some projects are still holding the, the profit margins. How can we navigate it? I find that the market is still volatile and chaotic for, for even African countries as a continent to navigate uh, into the market. How can we young people navigate? So let me put you on the spot. Yes, I uh, was told by my primary school teacher that anybody who asks a question do have some thoughts. Do you have some thoughts? Because you say you understood, so it means you are in the process. Do you have some thoughts in one minute? Yes. Yes, what are your thoughts? My, my, my thought is that uh, the rules governing the market still, uh, they do not really allow Africa as a continent or young people to tap into the opportunity because I feel that the, the trade policy and the community is still more preoccupied in the defensive approach given on the... So what do you think needs to be done? I feel that the trade, uh, the policy should be fair for Africa to navigate on my perspective. Excellent points. Yes, I'll come back to the panelists. Please, even if questions were not directed to you and you have ideas, share them. But I'll start off with you, Dr. Lufonso. You look, uh, it looks like you're on a hot seat. That cash is... Uh, uh, Looks like people are feeling it already. What says you? The hardest part of this job is to defend the bank <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> but I'm used to this already. <laughs> so um, thank you for your questions. And I think I'm going to marry those two questions together. Um, please keep something in mind. In the global system that we all exist in right now, finance does not exist in a vacuum. Finance is nested within the overarching policy system or the state society arrangement of a country. In a country like South Africa, they have a department, a whole ministry called small businesses, where someone or a university can apply for government finance. And in fact, some of the private corporations, philanthropic capital available, we tie that capital together with our department in order to make work available. It's the same finance, driving research and the likes. In some places, particularly in the US, most universities will have an incubation program, that entrepreneurship based incubation program, and that has indeed cat uh, catalyzed investment flows to the communities and also ultimately uh, to the people. We need to push for such uh, an arrangement in our country. It's a lot easier for AFDB to put 20 million, 50 million dollars in that program at the national level and together with Rockefeller and others. And that system, and it can work through a third party, an NGO, if you don't necessarily trust the government, but you know, there's a third party that can help that the resources are available to people. Unfortunately, we have that gap. So look, a young entrepreneur is here, a bank that is doing $10 billion is here. There's a huge gap between them. So the best we've done is to create intermediaries in terms of either financial institutions or incubation organizations. And we actually do that. Um, I mean, if, for those in Kenya, there's an organization called NetFund. 
the National Environment Trust Fund. So it's a national fund, but, and we put some resources in there to run an incubation program. In fact, when the incubation program was done, those who had very good ideas, right. who had business, and, and please, probably. Richard, have you heard of a name called Grand Prix Nurse? So there are young people who develop idea on how they are writing proposal to get grant. But when it comes to moving away from grant and moving into business, they, they, don't, they get stuck or they are not interested. And so we have been able to make sure that those who are really serious, who could be skilled, then we also did, we matched them together with some other private sources of capital, together with some blended finance. So there's a whole structure that creates the space for the finance to flow. You're not gonna hear of somebody, a World Bank or AFDB with the billions and then calling people to say, come and apply here. It, it, it's not. There's a missing link and that is what we need to fix. And we've got some ideas. I think but time is not on our side. Thank yeah, you. But I think you Richard, let me ask you, if you came to me for money, and I couldn't give you money, but I money to create a business and a market opportunity for you, have I been valuable to you? Absolutely. That's another thing, because we must also shift our mind away from the transaction or the, a transactional relationship between uh, young entrepreneurs and banks, because the banks, especially AFDB, can use its convening power to get into spaces that can create market opportunities for people. That is the value. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, I will get to you this month before I get to uh, Omnia, uh, Jane, and Bora. You are a young person. You are an entrepreneur. You are an action entrepreneur. Do you think what Dr. Rufonso is saying is something that makes sense? <laughs> you are on work. Yes, uh, I think that it makes it, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I, however, all the questions are also still very much valid because, for example, for us, he talked about Grand Prix Nuage. At the very beginning, a lot of people need some catalyst for it to, to, to take off. And if the conditionalities are not allowing really ideation stage to be financed, then it becomes really difficult for you to even know who is having a really good potential of becoming uh, an, emplo an, emplo an employer as against somebody whose business is highly risk. And so I think you have to put in measures that can de-risk some of them. For example, in Gayo, we also put in regranter mechanisms. And those regranter mechanisms are just to step in and de-risk. Why do you feel feel so scared of supporting this idea for you. So it helps that which Guy will have already demonstrated. And I think building on what Dr. Lufonso said is we need to leverage on what works so that every partners meet in the middle, so to speak. Do you think, and I want to put you on the spot this one, that from the experiences, the young people that you guys are leading across the continent, and you are doing amazing work with the team, that the data that can be used to influence your legislators in your own constituencies 
to put in place enabling environment and bills that can help government to de-risk private lending. Because that's what he is saying. Africa Development Bank will lend to those that will be able to repay back. So what do you think young people across the continent need to do now to hold policy makers to help build on what you guys are doing so that they become part of policy, not only be seen as pockets of successes and they don't get off to fit into policy process? I to talk about the please just two minutes and then we move to... Uh, yeah, I, I think that partnerships and collaborations is key here because one thing that has been developed, uh, de bedeviled on young people is the perception that they do not have credibility, perception that they do not, uh, they are not able to follow standard, perception that they have not been able to manage certain volumes of money before, and because of that, uh, uh, they are not qualified, or even the youth quota itself. Uh, it connotes a uh, small amount in many cases. Sometimes the idea really de demands certain quantum of money for it to fully take off. But they will give you so small that it will not work. And in that case, they say, oh, because your idea was not good, but that's not true. So I think collaborations with already those that are functioning very well and have a full-fledged team would help such a young person. And then also uh, partnerships with uh, very uh, known businesses would help. Excellent. Omnia, you've heard the word perception. And um, risk, risk adverse, risk adverse. Nothing is easy, right? Those, those. So what this one is saying about perception, this is real. I mean, this is, we're not living in Jupiter. We're living here, right? And we see this all the time. There is, first of all, fear to be able to venture into the unknown. And sometimes the ease of following a narrative, even if it is wrong. What do you think young people need to do to wipe out this perceived kind of a bubble thinking sometimes that makes them fear and they miss opportunities in the process? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and one thing I wanted to mention is that, first of all, when we look at climate change that is affecting us, we need to think about the resilience and the mental health of the young people that are under the distress of the climate emergency. But at the same time, we're also pushing them towards being innovative, being creative in terms of their solutions, having the right pitches to get funded. But at the same time, we do not look at their own resilience. Are they able to adapt and cope with the impacts of climate change? Are they able to respond? But also, it's very important to think about the solutions that we're proposing yes, it has to be workable and actionable, but it also has to be based on the needs of their communities that they are part of, the needs of their own demographic, and to also respond to one of the questions in terms of why are the finance flows not working for young people. We need to think about the accessibility of these opportunities. Who are we sharing these opportunities to? Are we only sharing it to the young people who have online access? How about the offline youth who do not get access to these opportunities? They are doing amazing work, but they're not part of the spaces that we are here now. They are not the usual suspects that go to these events. So we need to find ways to make sure that they have equal accessible opportunities that reach them the most. And then we are going to see the real impact because we're also looking at that. And for us to do that, we also need to, again, partner up with youth organizations when we are developing strategies, when we are developing funding opportunities, because not only are they going to advise from a youth-led perspective about these young people, they're going to make sure that these opportunities uh, reach them. Actually, you mentioned a very important point, mental health, accessibility, and sometimes the bubble people that sometimes the um, uh, well-to-do you, let me use that word, show to, they're not well-to-do you, which makes them become under a huge pressure and think that they're missing out, when in reality they're not missing out, they're actually doing better than those who should get this. I'm bringing this up because it's a reality that's <laughs> seen, especially with young people across the continent. And I just want to get your thoughts, please. It's just your thoughts. You know, particular format. Do you think that the young people who are opportune to assess opportunities in terms of knowledge are doing enough to cascade that knowledge down to those common financial, those young people at the community level who have access to internet? And if not, what do you think can be done differently? Yeah. Yeah, um, being in, being wor working with youth-led organization as a young person myself for over eight years, I've been very inspired to see how we always have this very um, inspiring peer-to-peer -peer, 
uh, framework where we always transcend the, our knowledge, our experiences to one another, which is very important. You also mentioned that we need to have mentors who are those in the policy making space, but we also need to have young mentors who have these amazing experiences, who got access, who got funded. We know, for example, the Youth Adapt Challenges have almost 30, 40 young champions every year. They themselves are mentors because they got that access to this opportunity, made impact to their own communities, and can onboard further young people um, to do the same, which is very important. But also to look at it statistically, there's been a very interesting study that was done just last year by a group of youth-led um, activists and organizers, and they calculated how much of the global climate finance was less than 1%. There's a very interesting study that UNICEF published two days ago that looked at the global climate finance, how much of it goes right. into youth responsive activities and initiatives, and it was around 2.4%. It's 2.4%, yes, we are quite very right. It was 2.4%, and that shows the disparity uh, when it comes to financing. Deborah, you've heard um, already the aspects, lack of accessibility, and you work with indigenous people, young people at communities. How do you think, what are the gaps? Because there is the global stock take process, the audit, since the Paris climate change was adopted, to understand the gaps, what has worked, what has not worked, and what needs to be done to ratchet up ambition. Let me bring it this, to this perspective. If you were, the report is already, is going to be launched at COP28. But if you were to say one thing or two things that the global stock take should take into consideration to solve the issue of young people in communities and indigenous young people, what would it be, practically, from the lessons you've learned from what you do? Yes, thank you. Uh, I just want to answer, taking into, into your right. point. Um, it is a lot of young people doing a lot of things, but it is the need to facilitate the communication from them to the community. Because we cannot only leave all that, that responsibility to one person that is doing such an amazing job right, in this space, but we actually need funding mechanisms that really will enable these people and facilitate them to go back to the community and to share with all these youth uh, uh, people. And, and I will say um, that two things, we need to build the capacities, really, for the youth people, and we need to build flexible mechanism for youth people. I would say we, we do those two things on the ground, <coughs> and then we let opportunities to, to come. Yes, many have argued that anything beautifully done at a local community, because across the continent, for example, like Desmond, Olufonso, Jen, and Omnia can tell you, amazing innovative examples by young people. Some of them carry out these initiatives even without financing. Some of them volunteer their time. They spend sleepless nights, they do a lot. But this information never finds the policy space. And policy is the biggest driver of change. And I think that's something that needs to be put um, up front. Because anything you do, when it doesn't shift to policy, it will remain there and there is really the scalability. That's one. But the other aspect that I want to Jen, I'll come to you on carbon markets, and you will answer the question that came. And please just provide what you can provide. But this, what I'm trying to say now goes to everyone on the table. Before I get back and get one or two questions, and we'll start to run up, is that there is this question that always comes up. When a young person comes up with a new idea, instead of it being embraced, question sometimes is, where has it worked? Do you think that's a defeatist um, approach to discourage young people? And how can we reverse this? Yes, Deborah, you can take it, or I see Omnia is itchy to take it. Yes, please go ahead, go ahead, I, I know, okay. Thank you. I, I will say that um, we need to de deconstruct a lot of the narrative that we have around, around these issues. I mean, we really do need to co-create, and, and, I, and I think that is a learning opportunity, like a big learning opportunity for us to, to listen to the, to the youth and co-create this new narrative that are really will enable them to participate. Because when you talk about policy changing, I mean, this is participation, and this is like getting into, into the real um, negotiating part, right? And you have to have all these skills, you have to have all these contacts, you have to have these mechanisms, ways to really move around this world, of policy world, that is this, a whole other issue, very complex 
in many situations and it will right. vary from country to country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Jen, you heard the question about carbon markets, lack of accessibility, no information, which you did mention. What would you say to the gentleman that asked this question? Uh, there were two gentlemen who asked the question. One of them, I put him on the spot and he mm -hmm. provided mm -hmm. some feedback, so mm -hmm. life is easier now. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you say, what would you add to that, uh, to answer the question from those two gentlemen? And I think there was another gentleman on that side, and then the um, lady who asked the question, Nora, she asked a question, and I think Oluf also answered it. But if any of you can still add to that, but focus on carbon markets. Um, uh, thank you again, Richard, for the opportunity. I will answer that question based on my personal experience uh, working at the project, uh, based on what I normally do on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, working with the youth and working with the local communities. So the, that question was structured in a way, how does the youth navigate into the carbon market? Um, in, the, in our project, the Kasigao Corridor Red Plus project specifically, how we've been able to engage the youth. I mean, through the carbon income, the youth are also involved in decision making. They can be able to decide um, where does this money go to? Is it a water project? Is it about business opportunities? Is it about sustainable agriculture? So we are trying to involve the youth in every decision ma making that comes with the carbon income. And then uh, we, we try and look and say, okay, we have the youth, what do they need? They need education, we provide bursaries, educational scholarship to them. What else do, do, uh, uh, what else do, do they need? They need to put food on the table. We have a, sust a sustainable agricultural program where youths can decide to you know, plant crops that do very well in arid areas especially our area, it's a very arid and semi-arid area. So we are trying to engage the youth in different programs that they can, uh, you know, work on to try and uh, improve their livelihoods. I don't know if that... Uh, yeah, thank, you. Yeah. thank you very much. I think there was yeah. a, a dimension to it. That's a very beautiful answer yeah. to it from... Um, is there regulation for these markets already in the country? Or what's up, what, what, what you are up there to with it? Um, Honestly speaking, I would say, um, is there regulations in the country? That is not uh, my area of expertise, but yeah. I'll be happy to... I think uh, uh, Lufonso will yeah, jump to it. To take Anybody? you to the right people. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I'm not an expert. No. Um, is there a regulation? So many of you may know there's just been a law that's just been passed. So National um, Carbon Market Activation Plan is currently uh, in process in Kenya. But Richard, let me say this, and I, and I don't want to sound very pessimistic, but it's, I like us to understand the complexity of a thing before mm -hmm. we get too excited about it. Exactly. The carbon market is it's, it's a complex market. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll explain why. First and foremost, it's a behavior market. You commit that you're going to behave in a good way for 30 to 40 years. Now ask yourself, do you really think <laughs> you can behave in a certain good way for that. So, do you understand? Number two, it's also a complex market because we're pricing the priceless. Um, and, and the complexity around it is, in the law of economics, if this demand is higher than the supply, the price is supposed to be high, isn't it? Yet we keep hearing that there's a huge demand for carbon credit, the supply is limited, but that is an inverse proportionality to that law because the price is extremely low. And so there's a thing about the price model that is different, particularly in the voluntary carbon market, because it's also a two-side two of a coin. So you've got a voluntary carbon market that we're operating that is pricing at $10 per ton at best. Then you've got a compliance market in Europe that is operating at anything between 100 to $125 per ton. Same carbon, same planet, but different pricing. And so it's very important to know, understand that. And I think the activation policy framework comes down to the ability for the country to define the structure of the market so that people don't work too hard for too little. Right. People, and, and I want to keep that, but it, it's not to discourage us, please. It's just for us to deepen our knowledge, understand the complexity, so that when we respond to it, 
we do that from a very knowledgeable standpoint. Thank you very much, Dr. Olufon. So for that, uh, it's not to discourage anyone, but straight talk sometimes is also very, very important and innovative. Uh, this morning, uh, before I get uh, questions from the floor, uh, and if there's any panelists who want to throw some answers to some of these aspects, I, I know uh, or, uh, I'll go back to you, uh, Omnia. Uh, this morning, you guys have an irrigation project that you guys have been running and you foster a public-private partnership. But in the continent, when they mention the word public-private partnership, it is seen at that high level of big businesses, infrastructure projects. What I would like to hear from you is, um, from a very practical perspective, how can you use what you do to ensure that at least communities with their local cooperatives can be leveraged to actually showcase public-private partnership uh, in such a way that everybody benefits. And the last aspect is what um, Dr. Lufonso have articulated here is very, very important, carbon markets. But sometimes the discussion also forget the fact that people are markets, markets are people. So what you produce in a community, if it does, it's not solving a problem, then you are losing a market. So what, what I'm trying to, and I'm coming to you because you are doing all this, and do you think that, and I go back to the framing and the narrative as Omnia and Olufonso said, do you think that we are, we are, we are not fought right with reality? And if so, how can we change course? Two minutes and then I get back and then I come for the concluding. Uh, uh, and then I get to Omnia and then get one question or two. Yeah, I think starting with the uh, public-private partnership, I think what we realize is that sometimes there is everybody recognize the need for example a community an informal community re, uh, of waste pickers for example realize the power that a, a state authority holds at the district level or the lowest point but then the fact is that they do not know how to also approach these uh, state agencies because government bureaucracy and also the same perception that we talked about. So what we realize is if you support these people and help them structure because sometimes they are not able, they are not structured in a way that they can fit into some of the requirement for the public-private uh, partnerships that are happening. So we yeah. help some of these ones to structure. And when that is happening, it always helps uh, or it creates a more uh, convenient atmosphere for operation and in, uh, efficiency. Uh, res with respect to the carbon market question that uh, you also posed, I agree with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, who says that it is a complex uh, space because, of course, in Africa especially where there is so much porosity and we do not have our own verification mechanisms, it becomes really, really difficult called one to avoid the double counting and two also to get the value that is required um, and of course it's mostly de uh, depending on additionality so for example what we tell young people who are working on areas that can actually qualify to go into the carbon market is that focus on do your your statistics focus on how much returns can you get without some of these markets and then let it become an additional opportunity for you if it does support that's part of the de-risking that you mentioned. And um, I will uh, get to the audience. Only two questions, please. And we'll bring them back and they will answer as they conclude. Yes, um, Esther. Straight to the question. Yes, uh, mine is a comment, so you can minus it as a, as a question. But it's with regards to the, uh, the national... Uh, climate change bill. Uh, my name is Esther, I'm a legal officer. So with regards to that bill, what, it t uh, what the act now tends to do is to, uh, is to regulate and have uh, people who benefit from uh, the carbon uh, credit have that distributed to the communities around such project and also just to have a, a list of which technologies these carbon credits can come from and also just to have a list of it. So I know there's still a bit of debate. We are very optimistic as Kenya to have passed this act. There are a bit of um, discussions ongoing on how it's not um, uh, practical or even beneficial. We also have a carbon markets bill that is there and a number of bills that are coming up. It's optimistic for Kenya but uh, we are looking forward to those discussions and uh, personally I look forward to demystifying those acts and probably sharing an article on the same. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, input. Very, very important. So a young person, before you go, uh, let me put you on the spot. 
A young person listening to this uh, may call it jargon sometimes, right? Um, what does a bill, a carbon market bill, does to me? So do you think, in your own capacity, working with young people, inspiring them, do you have a plan to start engaging in your own capacity? Yes, I do plan. Uh, something I should also comment through the climate change act now. Uh, we have, uh, it's one of the acts that has pro provided for a youth representative in the committee to sit uh, with the government. So it's definitely a position I look forward to uh, just um, engaging with. Uh, they've given an opportunity for one person, Excellent. but definitely it's a chair that we definitely look forward to interact. I also do an I act IRENA program where we uh, give information to youth on renewable energy and climate change and how they can start engaging. So we Perfect. diversify everything and we are able to do that. So thank, thank you very you so much, much for sharing your knowledge. Yes, please. Any other question? Um, okay, please. Straight to the point. Yes, I'm straight to the point. I think those extra questions or comments then... Yes, please go ahead. Yes, my name is uh, Stephen uh, from Kenya. Yes, just... Yeah, I run a, an organization called the Lilis CBO. One Great. of our blue chip uh, project is a community radio station. And this question goes to Jen because you're talking about amplifying the voices. And one of the things that I have always insisted is that sometimes... Please just go straight to the question. Yes, yes, yes. We don't have time. Okay. So what are the plans to work with community media stations? Because they have more time, they have more capacity right. compared to commercial radio stations. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yes. Hi, my name is Emma Lawrence. I'm from Imperial College London Climate Cares. We work on climate change and mental health, also with indigenous communities, farmers, youth. Um, we know that there is a real need to support young people and everyone actually to build psychological resilience um, and agency in the face of the challenges of the climate crisis um, to also support their mental health and well-being. So these kind of programs that we're discussing is an amazing opportunity uh, to uh, take action as young people and collective action that could also support mental health. Um, however, how do we, for capacity building purposes, um, build that psychological resilience, build that social resilience, build that agency in young people because we know a lot of young people are just feeling despair, they're feeling the effects of crisis after crisis after crisis. So within capacity building, how are we focusing on mental health and psychological resilience and all of the win-wins that come with that and the agency, um, that, well, the benefits that come with building agency. And the second question is, as much as we really need to uh, ensure that youth have a place at the table, we know that they're feeling incredibly um, betrayed by the people currently in power right. and that their futures are at stake and that's causing an enormous um, mental health crisis as well for many young people. So how do we ensure that young people do have a seat at the table but also that there is mechanisms to hold leaders to account for young people to hold those people to account um, for the promises that they're making and the rhetoric that they're using but actually that they're taking actions and that there are mechanisms to hold them to account. Um, I'd just like to hear right. your comments. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And please, as you answer that, provide your concluding remarks because um, we have, uh, I'll give you guys one, one minute. I don't know how you do the magic, but as you answer that, you, are, you give your answers to those uh, questions. Uh, provide your concluding remarks uh, showcasing the opportunities you are seeing and the gaps that can then inform the global stock tech in whatever thing that you are doing and the measures of the good things that you are doing. I'll start with you, Desmond. Uh, reacting yeah. to those questions and providing your concluding remarks. Two, two minutes. So, so, yeah, thank you. In this case, I will answer only a few questions. Um, the, the last one, which talks about getting young people to have a seat on the table and holding leaders accountable. I think one example I want to give is the Youth Climate Council that we uh, established two years ago. It's an institutional mechanism of bringing young people together to contribute to national policy decisions. And if each of the countries that we've started this has its own different way of approaching that, because young people are now together and they have one uh, mechanism or one through one way that they are able to bring all their voices and give it to government, it becomes more easier that government is not able to uh, always say that you are operating in silos. I do not know right. who to engage so and what have you. So the gap is that normally government is engaging maybe cronies and not 
the people who really, really matter. So when you bring all the young people to the same room, then government have no leeway. And the other thing is the concluding remarks, because there's right. no time. Yep. I think that all these things we are talking about still boil back to one thing, which is about trust. So we're trying to make sure that everybody, as a global philanthropy agency, as a, a bank, as an investor, you have to begin to trust young people. You have to begin to fund, finance people based on trust, beyond uh, uh, the, the risk. Otherwise, young people still have so much to learn, and they still have so much to gather. So if you want to, uh, to, to really, really rely so much on the risk that you are looking at, you may not be able to support. And we know that the young people in Africa uh, will, uh, will be doubled in, in, a, in a matter of a few years. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. Omnia, yes, your last word. Um, yes, um, my last word would be uh, just answering to uh, Dr. Emma's question is around that having young people and answering to you as well, part participate in political spaces mm -hmm. is very important, but it has to be providing them with the psychological and mental health support in order to do that. But also this comes from, again, what Desmond mentioned, the institutionalization of young people's role. When we feel that we are heard and we're not uh, basically speaking to the void, and that our perspectives are integrated. One good example is during this assembly, we know that there's a Nairobi declaration, but then the declaration that was done by young people was not integrated. And this is something that brings a lot of distress in young people, and particularly disconnect between what young people are advocating for and what the right. institutions are doing. So it's very important to think about the meaningful and the true participation and integration of youth-led insights and perspectives either at the level of financial institutions or at the governmental level or within processes like the global stock take. Right, and uh, just uh, one last part before you go is um, what if they are not called to the table, which is what you are saying, even when they work hard, their inputs are not taken into consideration. What is the alternative? It's about being very persistent. There Thank is you. always a way. Thank Excellent. You. Persistent, persistent. Yes, uh, Deborah. Your last word as you respond to some of these questions uh, in a few minutes. Uh, thank you. I believe that um, for all the mental health, being in the community and actually restoring the natural governance of the community where there is the healers, where there is all the people that support you, I tell you because I, bec I come from a community that was hit by hurricanes every year, and that was the best days of my of my childhood because we've been together as a community and there was this big a huge uh, rice and beans cooking and a <laughs> lot of bread so I was thinking that that was the a party and actually it was not I mean we were hidden from the hurricane so having the community warm you and having the community to give you this heal that you need during these very stressful moments is the best thing, and, and I think we are lo losing that because we are actually uh, seeing a lot of youth coming, go, going out from the community, so this governance structure right. and the knowledge is, is sharing is, is, is being a challenge. Thank you very much, Deborah. Jen, what's your last word? Um, just to answer my colleague there who, who, who asked uh, how do we partner with community media stations. Uh, we, we do partner with community media station because we are based in a rural area. So how do you engage the rural community through the community media? So we've been working with them to create awareness about our project. And uh, at the moment, uh, we've been doing that on a county level because we are based in Taitata Veta County. But we are doing it, we are working on it towards uh, on a national level. I will so... We are very uh, welcome to work with community media station. On the um, mental health and psychological resilience, I would like to say something. Um, the Kasigao area is an area whereby you'll see the harsh effects of climate change. We have youths who have, uh, you know, have families and they've lost their cattle. People have planted and there's nothing on their farms. And how do you, uh, I mean, how do you encourage such people and tell them that all is not lost? You can still, you, you got this. So we do have after school mentorship programs in the different high schools and also in the universities where we engage the youth and we tell them, no. well, you come in this area, but you can do more. And to just uh, um, uh, conclude, I would like to say um, we are not doing enough, Richard. The more needs to be done. I feel like we need to have structured youth opportunities just for the youth, not the women, not the men, not just for mm -hmm. the youth. I feel um, this is one group that has been marginalized, 
and we need to consider them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jane, but I hold you uh, responsible for that particular one because uh, you will get an applause. I think you almost got an applause for that. So, um, but let me hold you on this uh, and to be realistic. Very good point. What is your take on the fact that being youthful is not because a 20-year-old young person today in 15 years is no longer a young person. Age is not static. It's dynamic. Do you think we need to start engaging our young people and making them know that it is value that matters, not necessarily just the age, because we are not young forever? What's your take? Vous pouvez donc donner vos points. Un, deux, trois points. Comme vous allez aussi nous donner vos remarques de conclusion, c'est-à-dire, est-ce que vous êtes prêts à marcher avec la trajectoire d'adaptation parce que la, les discussions qui se passent au niveau des continents, c'est juste une question de perception. Et quelquefois, c'est un peu pratique pour créer ces, cette collaboration. This has been a very brilliant conversation. Sitting here, I've really learned a lot from all of you. I, I think we, we, we must not underestimate the power of policy and the way policy can drive change, and especially systemic change that is needed uh, in, in, in our countries, in our, on our continent. And, and look, I, I call policy a runway because f finance takes off and lands on that runway. And we are policy, uh, the, the biggest portion of the population that can drive policy change is the youth. You know, and, and I think we are missing the opportunity to drive, to, to bring our innovations to bear. A few years ago, no, a few years ago, a few months ago, this country decided they wanted to plant 15 billion trees in 10 years. How many of you heard about it? And why people were talking about, no, should we do that? And I thought that's a missed opportunity because there's tree planting, there's tree growing. And every tree that needs to grow starts from a seedling. And just imagine the business of having high school, agricultural clubs in high school who are producing three seedlings at probably 20 cents of a dollar. And then they become an economic agent selling that to the government, and that is something that is very possible. And, and I think it's an opportunity for us to think. Every time there is a policy proposition, we must be able to think, how can we turn this to an economic opportunity? How can we champion innovations in that? Today, it's possible for you and, 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 and I think technology, and we, we haven't talked a lot about it, linking that policy agency that we have right. as actors, linking that with our exposure to technology, it, 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 it's, it's just a massive world of opportunities in order to digitize solutions, in order to scale them quickly. So my point again, and, and I want to end with this, is when you put on the, the mindset of an opportunity, where someone has put on the mindset of a problem, you both behave differently. The same thing somebody will call a cost is that what another person will call an incentive. The same thing, adaptation for some people is a cost, adaptation for some other people is incentive. So the way we frame and the way we perceive everything we're talking about is very critical for our ability to be part of the solutions. And I think my, my charge to you today and, and my lawyer friend, I want to challenge you. Do you know that it's possible for Kenya to create a carbon market where it is the market? The, the supply of carbon comes to that central market and the country can then use that to create a structured demand and sell to Switzerland. And instead of it going to voluntary carbon market, it sells to Switzerland at $50 per ton. 
it's still cheaper for Switzerland to buy a $50 per ton than right. to do an emission, to, to do an emission trading scheme of $125. Excellent. Do you understand? It's important, but you have to drive that change. You have to use your knowledge, your understanding to be able to say, why are we not thinking about this? Ghana and Switzerland are doing it. Right. Gabon and Thank Norway are doing it. Can yes. it happen in Kenya? But that's a charge for us. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Um, please give a round of applause to these amazing uh, panelists. Uh, you've heard it all. The mindset of opportunity and also the mindset of seeing a glass half empty and half full is just what makes the difference. And we've heard that youth opportunity to drive policy is what is missing out in the continent. And so the discussion of I need to be included needs to change to the discussion I will be included and you find your way to be included or you create your own spaces. We've also heard about the dimension of de-risking systems and the biggest de-risking tool that we need to have is our own selves by being ready, being prepared because preparedness is what makes the difference and trust can be established both ways. Young people need to be trusted so that other systems and institutions can trust them and you bring trust through also doing and playing your part. We've heard about flexibility and deconstructing the narrative, which came out very clearly, framing the narrative, deconstructing the narrative, and ensuring that at the end of the day, we make sure we also get right information and share lessons. Thank you very much. We have now come to the end of this conversation, and it was a pleasure. Can I ask that we put our hands to an excellent moderation by Dr. Richard? Thank you very much. Thank you all, have a good night.